The travel writer Eugene Fodor said in his 1954 book Valor by Rail that June was one of his favourite months to travel to the VSR. Though many Valorians would contest this claim, June is the month in which the Seltzumwald's infamous carnivorous trees uproot themselves and venture closer to civilization in search of fresh soil, and in which tunnelling Felsenbieber are most likely to surface and wreak havoc on building foundations, it is true that the weather in the Republic tends to be at its most pleasant during summer. Ison, can you hit me with that frost gun again? I'm dying! Unfortunately for Aya, Winterlich and co, the summer of 1911 was an exception to that rule. 1911 was, as a matter of fact, a staggeringly hot year in Western Europe, reaching temperatures that wouldn't be seen again in the region for nearly a century. All right, all right, move your collars up the back of your neck. Oh yeah, that's the ticket. Is that what you use the last of my ice flower extract for? Aye. It makes the perfect coolant. If I crank the dial all the way up, I can make ice cream in under 10 seconds with this baby. Wonderful. Now I know who to blame when the icebox turns room temperature and the milk goes bad. Don't you worry about that. When we get paid for this job, we'll have plenty enough for more ice flour and more milk. Doesn't that just fill me with confidence? Oh, lighten up, Telsey. Oh... That does feel good. Despite the heat, there was still work to be done, and the trio needed to deliver a shipment of contraband cigarettes to Crystal City. However, their efforts were being hampered by the increasingly common blight of civilized modern living, the traffic jam. I feel like we've been waiting to go through this checkpoint forever. When did everyone else in the world get a car? Industrialization marches ever forwards. Well, it should stop. Eh, tell, it's moving. Thank heavens. All right, stop the vehicle. Certainly, officer. Vehicle registration? So you're locals? From Terea, actually. We're making a delivery. I run this courier service. This is my chauffeur, and this is my manservant. We've been canvassing the area for a group of dangerous fugitives. Have you seen any of these men recently? The photos that the police officer showed to the trio were very familiar, in fact. They were the mugshots of men who had broken out of the FKA earlier in the year, and among them were Telesphore and Eisen themselves. Were it not for Colette's disguise-making skills, the men surely would have been noticed. Hmm, no. Well, maybe? No. No, I haven't. Sorry. I can honestly say I've never seen them before in my life. Ooh, I definitely would have remembered meeting this handsome fellow in the middle. Well, feel free to stop in at your local police station and let us know if you remember anything. Now, my associate and I are going to check the cargo bay, and then we'll let you on your way. Fashing Bauer, we've got a van to sweep. All right. Step out of the vehicle and... You. Oh, for fuck. What's he doing here? His job, I guess. This is the guy I was telling you about. Him and his friend are on the wanted poster. Look! Hold on a minute. Yeah, if you get rid of the moustache and sunglasses on him, get the turban off the other one... Chelsea! Already doing it. This was how Aya, Winterlich, and Geis ended up being on the wrong end of the Valorian Socialist Republic's first ever recorded police car chase. They sped across the bridge, then headed southwest, away from the road leading to Crystal City, and back into the countryside. Would either of you mind terribly if I took the van off-road for a moment? 
If it'll get us away from the police. Good, because I'm about to take a sharp ride into the Samson Mall. Oh, but I just repaired the mantelope claw holes in the roof last week. Come on. I said, do you want to go back to jail? Oh, no. And neither do I. Allons-y. Come on, get out! We ought to go after him! No way, my salary is not high enough. Ugh, all right. They're the forest's problem now. Though Aya and Winterlich often used the Seltzumwald as a hideout, they rarely strayed far from the dirt road that led from one side of it to the other. Outside of that one marked area, the mutable nature of the forest's dimensions only became more pronounced. The trees grew thicker, the terrain less predictable, and the passage of time more difficult to measure. By the time the vegetation got too thick for the van to pass through, and Telus 4 brought the vehicle to a stop, they could hardly tell if the canopy was blocking the sun, or if night had already fallen. The only light around them came from the van's headlights, and scattered patches of luminous plant life. Why are we stopping? Because I need to find the road before we go any further. You don't know where it is? No. I've never seen this part of the forest before. Oh, what are you talking about? You never get lost. Well, there's a first time for everything. So, we're stuck here? Please tell me we aren't stuck here. Calm down, Colette. I'm still perfectly capable of navigating. I just need a moment to get my bearings. Well, you had better do it quickly. I don't like how dark it's suddenly gotten. And neither do I. So, I take it neither of you want to come with me to see if I can find the road. Well, uh, someone needs to make sure the van's still roadworthy after that, Jace. Colette? Sorry, Telesphore. I, I would love to, but I'm not dressed for trekking. And it's scary. And I don't want to. I see. Well, don't let the van leave your line of sight. Keep a weapon handy, and if you hear me calling to you... Close our eyes, ask what your name is, and don't open them until you answer. Start a fire, just in case. Right. A bientôt, mes amis. Throughout the long history of the region, there have been multiple attempts to map the Seltzamwald, all unsuccessful. Even with the advent of thermal imaging and drone technology, Geologists, cartographers, and urban planners alike have still only scratched the surface. The leading theory for why it has proved so impenetrable, which was first proposed by Valorian naturalist Hans Le Guin von Kristallstad in 1870, is that the ambient magic of the forest is more concentrated the further one gets from human civilization, much in the same way that oceans become deeper and darker the further one gets from the coast. All right, by the direction of these walking shrub tracks, the river should be that way, which means the road is... Oh, that doesn't look good. In his search for the road, Telesphor had stumbled across a clearing, but as his eyes adjusted from the darkness of the forest to the sunlight, he realized he was far from achieving his goal. Instead of the road, he saw a makeshift fence of sharp wooden spikes mounted with human skulls. Behind that fence was a row of canvas tents, and above those, a tattered red flag bearing the emblem of a surfing buck rearing up on its back legs, wings extended. Intruder! Not good at all. Well, the wheels have been realigned and the suspension's back in order. Whenever Telsey gets back and points us towards the road, we'll be good to go. Good. <laughs> Nothing too spooky happened while I was out there? Not yet. You know what this situation's making me think of? I'd rather you not tell me. Did you ever hear of the story of the Lost Platoon Collect? No. It happened during the war. Not too far from here. My division wasn't there when it happened, but I know plenty of people who were. A group of revolutionaries got cornered just outside the Bupont by the Imperial Army, 15th Company. But they managed to turn the tide, split the company into thirds. 
50 were shot, 50 ran away, 50 got driven into the woods. They were never seen again, but every so often someone claims they hear marching drums coming from this part of Seltzumwald. They are still marching to this day, from beyond the grave. Don't you ever tell me a story like that again, Ison. <laughs> oh, come on, Diamond Heat, I'm just fooling around. Besides, if any monsters jump out at us, you can zap them and I can freeze them. And anyway, we both know ghosts aren't real. Can we talk about something else? Alright. Here, do you think you could cook popcorn with the Kingmaker? I think that would be a huge waste of energy. Aye, well, it'd probably be quicker than the stove, right? Ah, shit! Close your eyes! What's, What's the, the second, second letter, letter of, of your, your first, first name? name? It's E, as in everyone grab a weapon, we've got a serious problem. Huh? What kind of problem? Mantelopes? Police? Worse, monarchists. Though Eisen's ghost story had been greatly embellished over the years, the core of it was, in fact, based on truth. The 15th Company of the Valorian Imperial Army had lost 100 men in the Siege of Beaupont in 1886. 50 were lost to enemy gunfire, but the other 50 simply vanished into the Seltzumval. While their commanding officers assumed them dead by misadventure, this couldn't be farther from the truth. The so-called Lost Platoon had been living in a makeshift camp for the past 25 years and attacking any strangers unlucky enough to breach their territory. I have a good idea of where we can orient ourselves, but on the way I stumbled into a settlement and they didn't appreciate seeing me. Hand me my long-range rifle. Here! Damn! Ah, oh, they're faster than I remember the Imperial Army being! You sure these aren't one of yours? We don't use bows and arrows. Well, neither did the Imperial Army. But I don't know what to tell you, Eisen. They were flying the Scarlet Seraphon, and the only people I've ever seen do that were monarchists. <laughs> Get your hands off of me! Guys, I got one! I... Khalid, where did you... Do... Tell us for! Shit! Who wants it? Ha <laughs> <laughs> ha, nice try, but you're gonna have to try harder than... Unfortunately for Eisen, Telesphore, and Colette, their isolation from society had not made them any less formidable opponents. The leader of the Lost Platoon was 2nd Lieutenant Fernand Charbonneau. He had been 36 at the time of the Revolution, had a master's degree in political science from Crystal City University, and spoke fluent French, German, English, and Russian. The captain of the 15th Company described him as a true modern Renaissance man. Though he still appeared to be about 36 years old, almost nothing else about Charbonneau had stayed the same after spending several years in the maddening depths of the Seltzumwald. When he stood before Ayer, Winterlich and co, he was wearing a bloodied red and gold military uniform, with the crudely tanned skin of a mantelope draped over his head and shoulders like a Viking berserker. In one hand, he held a staff made of kersite polymers and tipped with a mantelope claw. Sir, the interlopers. We found them 247 heartbeats out of camp. The neighbour exploded Hauptmann, and the Hindu used artifice to knock out Moreau. How fortuitous. The enemy must be weakening. They send less and less each time. Attrition is the way, gentlemen. Whittle them down with patience. The 15th Company is the best for patience, I say. Aye, sir! Extra rat meat for the scouting party, and send for the king. Tell him the area is very nearly secured. Thank you, sir. Someone should tell him the king's been dead for a very long time. They don't know how long they've been stuck here, do they? Judging by the fact that they haven't aged either, that would be a fair assessment. Listen, let me do the talking. I think I can level with these people. <coughs> <coughs> Lieutenant, sir, permission to speak. You may. My name is Winterlich. I'm with the 17th out of Toria. I got separated from my platoon behind enemy lines five clicks outside of Shawnicht, but I managed to take two hostages. Yours was the nearest camp on the map. I just need to resupply, then I can be on my way. I'll add lying to your already very long list of crimes. Do you take me for a fool of sorts? 
No, sir, I don't. As you know, my people aren't naturally taken to lying. Your people are betrayers, the scum of the earth and the scum of the other place as well. I have seen personally how they turned their backs on this nation's army. We crossed into one of your settlements, and though we thought them our allies, we were refused entry. This statement was likely in reference to an event recorded in Sorbus in 1906, where a group of quote-unquote savages got into a minor altercation with the village guards. The Spriggans cut our already dwindling ranks on that day, just like you blew up Hauptmann with your invisible care sight gun. But we took one of their spears in retribution, didn't we, gentlemen? I sir! <laughs> <laughs> Primitive? Maybe. But one is forced to adopt jungle ways when the gunpowder goes so very quickly, as does the food. But we make do. Spears and arrows and rat meat the 15th are the best for ingenuity, aren't we, gentlemen? Aye, sir! Did everyone talk like this in the 80s? I hate to break it to you, mate, but the reasons your rations dried up so fast is you've been out here for 25 years. The war's over. <laughs> The same ridiculous claim made by the others who came before you. Luckily, as a genius, I am immune to psychological warfare, and you are the worst liar of them all by far. If you aren't a filthy democratic socialist cornbug, then why do you wear a Feverite engineer's jacket? Because I used to be one, and now I'm not. Once a cornbug? Always a cornbug. The greatest crime of them all, I say. Now, if you are done with your lie spewing, allow me to tell you the truth of the matter as I see it. You, Kersite deserter, and you, thieving Feverite, thought you could take refuge in the Seltzam vault with this innocent serving girl as your hostage. Your mistake was thinking that the illustrious Lieutenant Charbonneau and his men wouldn't pay you any mind. Here is exactly why this is the most important strategic position in the King's army. These woods are normally impenetrable to good Christian men. Only scoundrels and foreigners can navigate them. But we are so skilled and so smart that we are one with it now. Any rebels travelling through here stand no chance at all. You're making a mistake. See, I wasn't kidnapped. I'm actually travelling with them of my own free will. She's so hysterical that she speaks nonsense, poor creature, Jerome Berenger. Take her away, lest her fragile mind be further broken by exposure to these fiends. Yes, Lieutenant? Best do what he says, Khalid. Lord knows you won't be able to reason with him. Okay. As for you two, for all the crimes listed and more that I'm sure you're also guilty of, you will be put in the stocks while appropriate punishment is decided. Gentlemen? Yes, sir. Make sure the care site traitor is blindfolded and bind the artificer's fingers. Eisen and Telus Four were summarily dragged out into what passed for the camp's yard between two dilapidated tents directly in view of a large pile of bones. Their only small mercy was that the sun had dipped low enough behind the tree line that the temperature had lowered significantly. What's that horrible smell? I'm pretty sure it's the last poor bastard they had in the stocks. Colette, meanwhile, received a more hospitable treatment, for a given definition of hospitable. <coughs> Ice water to soothe your nerves. The lieutenant has given us strict orders. You are to be scrubbed clean, like a beautiful horse. I'm capable of taking a bath on my own, you pervert! Ow! Scrubby, scrubby. Don't accuse us of ungentlemanly intent. Beringer is a sexual invert, and my manhood was recently obliterated in combat. We have been assigned this task as we are the least perverted of the entire platoon, in fact. We would be most obliged to also remove the giant crystal spear tip from your skull. No, don't! I, uh, I want it to be there. What did you do with my clothes? The lieutenant has requested you wear this. Oh, Ugh, how kind of him. The offending garment was a bright orange bodice and skirt set with puffed sleeves, lace frills and black bows covered in garish blue and green dots. 
By Colette's estimation, it was from sometime in the mid-1890s, and the obvious stains and rips suggested that the ensemble's previous owner had not given it willingly. When Colette went to meet with a lieutenant at his tent, she found him outside, pointing his spear up at a flock of giant moths that was passing overhead. He tossed the spear and hit one, killing it before it even hit the ground. Ah, I was just sending a missive to my captain regarding today's events. We had no pigeons when we were caught here, and our horses were all devoured. But I have found that the Aeglians make for excellent courier birds, despite being insects of a sort. Colette then watched as Charbonneau tried for several agonizing seconds to tie a tiny scroll to one of the moth's antennae. Now fly! To your purpose! Where the dead moth had been tossed, there was already a modest pile of other dead moths, with similar scrolls tied to them. You, um, wanted to speak to me about something? Oh, yes, please, my dear, come into my tent and take a seat. I shall set aside my murder spear for such matters. A little music, perhaps, to soothe your nerves. Oh, all right. You must be famished from your harrowing ordeal. Here, I have a selection of very, very delicious cakes. Before Colette was a cracked serving tray adorned with a selection of plates stacked high with rocks and mud. Bread was obviously not available to the men of the Lost Platoon, but as Charbonneau had said, they were not adverse to improvisation. Wow! Well, don't just stand there and stare appreciatively. Take a seat. Okay. A glass of wine? Thank you, but I'm more of a beer person. A glass of wine. I would love some. You will find it to be an excellent vintage 1867. Mmm, <laughs> yeah. Tastes old. So that's a very interesting spear. Is the claw from the same mantelope as your head thing? Twas indeed. A noble beast who fought valiantly and killed six of my men before I bested it with my rifle. I felt it only fitting that I pay tribute to the creature by using his hide as my armor and his claw as my spearhead, like the Teutonic Knights of yore. Cool. And the handle is... A Caresight war axe. Even with my great intelligence, I could not figure out what turns the blade from lazy copper wire to sparkling, slicey blue flame, but waste not, want not. Still useful to me as a stick with bits on it, I say. That is so... noble. Are you enjoying your wine? Oh, yeah. We take what little joys we can out here. Eighteen months fighting back the rebellion. Two weeks stationed in this hellhole. Sometimes I must admit it feels more like years. That's the horrible thing about war. Not that you need to worry your pretty head about it, little cauliflower. War is too stressful a topic for a nice young lady such as yourself. What did you just call me? A nice young lady who I will hope will stay for a time. We have all very much missed the company of the fairer sex. I know my humble camp isn't much, but I assure you, we can be very civilized when we want to be. My name is actually Colette, by the way. A lovely name. Please, don't be shy. Have a cake. Oh, you're very kind to offer, but they look slimy, so... Have a cake. Thank you, I would love one. Delicious. <laughs> I'm sure you must be wondering what of your horrid captors. Fear not, good Mademoiselle Cauliflower. They will be summarily reprehended. Oh, did you, uh, get a, a moth back? 
Indeed, and the captain agrees with my assessment for the horrendous crimes they have committed against the Crown and against this platoon, they will be executed. Can you do that? Oh, I'm afraid the captain's message was quite insistent. Those who are dishonest and disloyal like rats will be killed like rats and cooked like rats. Cooked? Rat meat. At least as nutritious as chicken, I assure you. No, 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 no. I'm done playing along. You're crazy. Crazy? Of course not. I'm the picture of intellect. No, you're not. You're wearing a mantelope and you're a cannibal. I won't let you cook my friends. See now? The truth reveals once again. Curses. I fell for your ruse after all. When at first you said you were traveling with the enemy of your own free will, I assumed it was a lie, but now I see that you lied about lying. A classic double reversal. <laughs> well played. But let's see how you play this. Murder Spear! No, please don't! Like the men who served under him, Charbonneau was fast. More than fast enough to block Colette's way out. In an instant, he had driven her back into the tent, with his spear raised high and ready to stab her. As she cowered over the desk, Colette could only think to grab the end of the spear and try to push it away from herself. Get your hands off it and let me kill you! No! But when she did that, something highly unexpected happened. The axe started working. With her captor separated from his head, there was still a matter of freeing Telesphor and Aizen from their fate on the butcher's block. Colette looked at Charbonneau's body, and slowly a plan formed, one that would, thankfully, give her an excuse to change clothes. Extra rat meat for the scouting party. Now truly the meatiest of all rats. This is it. This is the least dignified death a cook could ever possibly suffer. Men of the 15th Company, whatever platoon this is, now is not the time of rat meat. In what was definitely a career first, Colette had taken Charbonneau's uniform and used it as a makeshift disguise, even adorning herself with a lieutenant's mantelope skin hood. While any sane, rational person would have been able to recognize her immediately, the men of the Lost Platoon were neither sane nor rational. Colette hoped that as long as she convincingly imitated Charbonneau's odd way of speaking, she would confuse the soldiers long enough to escape. I, your genius lieutenant, have received a moth note of sorts. The captain has declared a murder cancelling. But, sir, extra rat meat for the scouting party? Cancelled, I say! These rats are so rat-like in nature that they're... They're too rat to even be rat meat. They're worms. Grubs, even. They must be unstocked at once so that I can personally escort them to their fate by orders of the king. Look at my moth if you don't believe me. Orders from the king, sir? Yes. If anyone disagrees, then die by my blade. Which works now. I fixed it. Gentlemen! Yes, yes sir. sir! Leave me to my ministrations. Yes, Aye, sir! Psst. Hey, guys! It's me! I never would have guessed. Is that a war axe? Oh, yeah. Um, See, I, I grabbed it to defend myself, and it just kind of switched on. No, that's impossible. Apparently not. With the Kingmaker's help, it isn't. Here, Ison, I'll cut your fingers free. Stay still. Out! Oh, careful, sweetheart. I said stay still. Now let's get out of here before they find out the real lieutenant's been decapitated. Decapitated? It's fine, it's fine. I would really rather not think about it. While Colette's ruse didn't last, it did give the trio enough headway to make it to the van. It took about five minutes for Jerome to see that the note tied to the moth he'd been handed was blank. When he went to clarify with the lieutenant, it took him a further ten minutes to confirm that his headless superior officer was not, in fact, just taking a nap. However, even with this added time, the men of the Lost Platoon could move in such harmony with the forest and with such frightening speed 
that the scouting party still managed to eventually catch up with their prisoners. Hey, there's the van, right where we left her. Ugh, finally. I feel like we've been walking for hours. Rat meat! Oh, come on! How do they do that? You two fight them off, I'll start the van. I remember the route I found earlier, and I'm absolutely certain of where we're going. Right. Who wants it? Have it! You take that, you Come on! Ah, uh, you want some? You want some as well, do you? Come on then! You take that! Ah, uh, yeah. I think I'm kind of getting the hang of this thing. Or not. <laughs> Little help? I've got you. Now get inside! The brush is too thick. I can't drive through it. You'll have to get out and cut through. Ah, oh, that'll take too long. So what do you suggest we do instead? The frost gun. If I freeze the plants, they'll become brittle enough to drive straight over. Brilliant! Just try not to hit the engine. Oh, you know I could never hurt the van, Telsey. With Eisen's ingenious brush-clearing method, the van was able to reach the road in just under 30 minutes. And so, after a harrowing afternoon, the trio were back in familiar territory. <sighs> Milk's gone bad. See, Eisen, what did I tell you? Aye, well, if I'd listened to you, we'd still be in the woods right now. <sighs> I suppose we can survive on black coffee for a few days. Maybe you can. I don't know how you can drink it straight. It tastes like dirt. All right, first order of business. Where's the nearest inn? Probably Rosenposa. Good. Well, the weather has certainly turned since this morning. I'm glad it's not as hot, but doesn't it feel a little dark out for 6 p.m.? Aye, but who's to say it's actually 6 p.m., though? Our watches might have wound backwards while we were in Seltzon Vault. Upon entering the Rose of the Rhine Tavern, the trio were immediately hit with a jarring reality, a chalkboard hanging above the bar that read September Specials. You both see that, right? I also see everyone here dressed in wool blends and autumn colors. Hang on, so that's what? Two months we just pissed away. Apparently. It's a seltzer mold for you. Utterly unpredictable. Aye, well, at least the police have probably lost their scent by now. Do you think our clients in Crystal City will accept a late delivery? Kingmaker Histories is a production of We Are Not Alive. This episode was written and audio engineered by Meg Malloy Tutin, with foley design by Jam Wright, and executive production by Henry Galley. Our theme was written and performed by Professor Shy Guy, and our music comes courtesy of Odd Chap and Vivek Abhishek. This episode featured, in order of appearance, David Alt as the historian, Blythe Renee as Colette, Takai Nazir as Eisen, Josh Rubino as Telesphore, Rob Dwyer as Fashingbauer, Lou Sutcliffe as Jerome, Johnny Sims as Charbonneau, and Matt Baker as Berenger, with additional voices by Henry Galley, Gus Zagarella, and Jamie Douglas. If you'd like to support the show, visit the links in the show notes. Thank you for listening, and we'll see you in two weeks. Thank you.